Okay. Because uh, in, in the timetable that is published on the website, uh, the finish, finish date would be May 27, but uh, there are four hours missing. So, or three, oh, no, sorry, four hours. So, I think, but we are at May, May 2, so May 9, May 16, we are away, but we can count three hours for May 16. Right. There for me, uh, okay. So I think uh, if you if we want to stick on May 27, which would be fine for me, which means uh, it's May 27. It's it's a Monday. Let me let me check. May 9 is a Monday. 16. No, it's a Thursday. So uh, if it means that we could make the exam next Monday, the first exam could be beginning of June, and uh, because. Uh, Sunday would be, I think, would be May 31st. Uh, no, May 23, May 3rd. Just one second, because I'm getting lost. Uh, this is a Monday, this is a Monday, this is a Monday. It, it's a Monday, which means that we could, uh, May 27 is a Monday, yes. which means that we could make the exam on the next Thursday, if you are ready, or uh, the Monday afterwards. Uh, so it could be, the exam could be May 30, which would be a Thursday, or could be June, uh, uh, June one third. Okay, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, third. Uh, original was the six of. June. Sorry, say again. The original day of exam was the six. Six of June. That was the original day. Okay, but we can anticipate if you want. Maybe we don't need to change the date of the exam. Okay, you want to keep it. Yeah. Okay. And uh, would you be willing to finish on the 27th, or uh, even uh, because it's a Monday, or could I finish on the 30th of May? Okay. It's, it doesn't matter to you? Okay. So, I think that, uh, okay, if I go to the 30th of May, I think if we go to the 30th of May, we could make with just uh, one additional hour. Okay, so it's, it's quite easy, let's say. And, uh, and we could do it, uh, I think it could be next uh, Thursday, May 9, because not the 16th. So I think it's better to anticipate rather than putting more hours at the end, okay? And uh, I will try at the end to keep the last lecture with exercises, so there is nothing new on May 30. I, I think we could just make May 9 one more hour and then we are done because for the field trip we can count three hours because actually it is and then that's fine, okay? So okay. only one day? Only, only one day, but I, I need to check the room. I think this could be available, but I'm not sure. I don't remember if somebody is coming later. I need to check, but if not, we change the room. I think we can find the room in this period. It's not a big problem. Okay, now let's move forward. So we were talking about design of river barrages, as you remember. And uh, we got to the point where we discussed uh, the elevation, the placement of the different uh, weirs. Uh, I get the figure. We got to... Okay, this is the figure. So we discussed uh, the elevation of the different wheels. We mentioned three wheels. Okay, it's already on. We mentioned three wheels, uh, which are the, the environmental flow spillway or wheel. I use the term spillway and wheel as synonyms, okay? 
and then uh, there is the environment of flow speedway, which is the, lower, the lowest one, and then we have uh, in uh, uh, at next altitude, next elevation, the diversion speedway and uh, the main speedway. I just would like to remind you once again, because I was a bit uh, rushing at the end of the lecture. So the environment of flow speedway is designed to convey a uh, little flow. It's uh, a flow that is, uh, again, imposed by low. It's very low. It's, uh, it's imposed by low, but, and it's very low. And uh, the diversion speedway usually is designed for withdrawing a higher flow with respect to the environment of flow. And the order of magnitude is varying. The, the order of magnitude of this difference is varying, but usually it is something related to maybe one order of magnitude, 10 times, OK? At most, I would say. And then the main spillway is designed to convey downstream flood flows which means that there is a huge difference between the magnitude of uh, environmental flow and uh, withdrawn flow with respect to the flood flow. It could be two, three orders of magnitude, 100 uh, times, 1,000 times, just in order to fix the order of magnitude in your, in your head. And, uh, you can understand this because uh, by looking at the flow duration curve. So if we depict here a flow duration curve, of course, uh, it may have uh, several different shapes. Uh, but usually, it looks something like something that is very steep at the beginning and then flats down. And then there is, a, again, a steep uh, tail. But usually, the tail is not as steep as uh, the first part of the flow duration curve. OK. And then here you have uh, the minimum flow Q min and the Q max. And this is duration usually of 365. What is the order of magnitude of the environmental flow? I give you an example. There was a law in Switzerland that was in force up to 10 years ago, more or less, which prescribed that the environmental flow should be around Q355. So it's something like this. This is the environmental flow. And then, what is the order of magnitude of uh, the flow that is withdrawn? We said that it's for hydropower plants, uh, maybe in the range Q30, Q60. So QD is something that is about here, QD. What is the order of magnitude of the flood flow? It's something that usually cannot be displayed on the flow duration curve because we said that Q max is, uh, what is Q max? Is uh, the flow with uh, an average duration of one day. So it means that it's a flow that on average happens once a year. The flood flow is uh, a flow that uh, up, um, occurs uh, once every 30, 50, 100 years. So it's something that usually goes much higher than Q max. Now, you see clearly that from this example, which is very general, QD and environmental flow are comparable. This is QD and Wu. QD is, of course, higher because it corresponds to a shorter duration. But the difference between the flood flow and the QD is much larger. And of course, the steeper the first part of the flow duration curve, the larger the difference between the flood flow and the flow that can be withdrawn. This is important to take into account. And uh, it depends on the river. Typically, in large rivers, the flow duration curve is flatter. It 
it's not very steep. Even in the, even in the first part, for large rivers, large catchments, uh, usually even the first uh, branch of the flow duration curve is not so steep. When you deal with the small rivers and torrents, the flow duration curve is very steep, typically, and may be intermittent, which means that it's so steep that crosses uh, the abscissa, which means that there are some days during the year when, on average, you don't have any flow. And therefore, the difference between environmental flow, design flow on the one end, and flood flow on the other end is much larger with torrents. So what you see in this figure, it seems like uh, the width of the environmental flow spillway is comparable to the width of the diversion spillways. In, actually, what happens is that these are quite a bit larger. And the width of the main spillway is much, much more. OK, of course, this is a sketch. But you have to keep into account that these are not comparable. They are completely different. They are meant for completely different purposes. OK. In fact, we will see that downstream, the environment of flow spillway, you have to be very careful because there might be, you know, a consistent energy of water there, <coughs> a consistent erosion. This is why we put protections there. We will discuss later about protections. Now let's focus on the facilities for withdrawing water because uh, the speedway is just the first one. As I said, the speedways, the diversion speedways are protected with gates, uh, which does not mean that there is an automatic regulation. It means they can be remotely, remotely governed, remotely maneuvered. But usually, it's not an automatic regulation of uh, the diversion spillway and uh, the river level. Usually, they are used in order to interrupt uh, the diversion when there are particular situations, like uh, turbidity, excessive turbidity. And also, they are used when one needs to clean uh, the other downstream facilities. Now, let's focus on these facilities here. Any diversion is usually equipped, uh, I would say, always equipped uh, with uh, facilities that uh, allow the sedimentation of the fluted material, the sedimentation of sediment. Because we need to remove sediments from water. What is the reason why we need to remove sediments? It's clear. If you downstream have uh, uh, some uh, water uses, uh, like, for instance, hydropower, you need to clean the water because otherwise the turbine gets damaged. If you have other facilities for irrigation, it's the same thing. If you need to put water into pipes uh, and then through devices uh, like, uh, like uh, sprinklers uh, for irrigation, you need to clean the water. Okay? And also, if you, mm, usually we have, uh, we have uh, infrastructures for delivering water downstream. They can be channels or canals. Uh, or they can be pipes. In both cases, if we use channels, which means open flow, we have to avoid sedimentation into the channels. Otherwise, we need to, to clean them. And the reason why we need to avoid it is clear, because uh, it reduces uh, the section of the canal. If we have pipes, uh, we cannot tolerate uh, much uh, suspended material because uh, there is abrasion, erosion of the pipe. Uh, if, you, if you bring uh, water with the gravel into the pipe, of course, uh, you, may risk, uh, you may run the risk of damaging the pipe itself. But actually, there is some tolerance uh, because uh, we don't need water that is perfectly clean, depending on the use, of course. If the use is uh, for, for um, feeding, water supply system for civil use, uh, we have more restrictions. We have restrictions on the presence of sediments. We have restrictions on the water quality, which are quite uh, strict for clear reasons. <coughs> Depending on the use, these restrictions may be weaker or stricter. And in particular, if you have devices downstream that uh, you need to use for managing water resources like turbines, like sprinklers, etc., usually the manufacturer 
tells you what is the max diameter of the sediments that can be tolerated by the device. For turbines it may be 0.3 millimeters, but it depends on the type of the turbine. And in some cases we have turbines that are able to route larger sediments. Of course we need to know what is the situation and we can adapt. But in any case, uh, we usually end up with uh, a max diameter that is tolerated by the downstream use. So, once that we know that this max diameter, it's clear that uh, we can design the facilities for removing the sediments by imposing that every sediment that has a larger diameter with respect to the max tolerated needs to be removed. And they are removed through deposition through siltation, okay? which means that the sediments settle down. Of course, to allow the sediment is suspended by the energy of water. It's the turbulence, it's energy of the flow that keeps the sediment suspended. If you want to allow the sediment to settle down, we need to slow down water in order to reduce uh, the kinetic energy. It's the kinetic energy that keeps the, the sediment suspended. And therefore the idea is uh, to put uh, uh, the water into pools uh, where the velocity of the flow is much reduced uh, to give the possibility, to give time to the sediment to settle down. And uh, these pools uh, cannot be very deep because uh, of course, settling the sediments requires a time that is proportional to the distance the sediment has to, to, to run before reaching the bottom of the pool. And therefore, the idea is that these pools might, should be large, but not very deep. So we need to, to increase the cross-sectional area because uh, you remember that there is a relationship that relates uh, even the water flow. There is a relationship that relates uh, if the water flow is Q, QD. There is a relationship that relates the water flow to the cross-sectional area of the flow and the velocity. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if you keep fixed Q, if you want to reduce the velocity, you have to increase the cross-sectional area. So the idea is to make a large pool because you have two ways for increasing the cross-sectional area. If you look at the cross-section of the pool, this is, uh, I don't remember the symbol that I'm using later. I hope uh, this is the depth, and the, I hope it is LD, I'm not sure. And this is the width. So let me use temporary symbols. And this is the cross-sectional area. And the flow comes out perpendicularly to the blackboard. Therefore, if you want to increase the area, you have two ways. Either you increase the depth or you increase the width. But if you increase the depth, you increase the time required for a sediment that is suspended close to the free surface to settle down. And therefore, the idea is, if it's possible, to increase the volume, the width, by keeping the depth small. And this is the idea of creating these pools. And these pools, of course, you collect sediments, so they need, they need to be cleaned. And in order to facilitate the cleaning, another idea is to separate the pool in two, in two pools. The first one is, is uh, tasked with uh, the mission of uh, removing gravel. The second one is, is, uh, has the purpose of removing sand gravel with a smaller diameter. The reason for splitting is just for make uh, cleaning easier. They are not always separated. In some, in some structures, especially when uh, uh, it, it, you don't have much space, because one problem is that when you work in mountain bases, you don't have much space. If you look at the cross-section of the river, usually the slopes are very steep, and you have the river here. And therefore, you, if you want to create space laterally, you need to work on the hill slopes, but you don't want to really make the hill slope unstable. So usually you don't have much space. This is why here you see that uh, 
the gravel drop and the sand drop are not much expanded laterally on the side of the structure. So if you have space, both in width and length, then it's advisable to separate the pool into, into subsequent sub-pools. If you don't have space, sometimes you may see that there is only one pool. And uh, you may have also only one pool when uh, there are no so much sediments uh, transported by the flow. Okay, but if we can, it's better to separate. How is the separation done? It's done by placing on the, on the floor of the pool a submerged step. So this step that you see here is usually submerged. To give you an order of magnitude, these pools may have a maximum depth, if, if it's possible, of 50, 70 centimeters. And the step here may have uh, an height of about 20, 30 centimeters. Once that you get uh, 30 centimeters of gravel in the gravel trap, it's time to clean it. What is the velocity of water that we would like to keep into these uh, traps. In the gravel trap, you can tolerate a higher velocity because gravel settles down even if you have some turbulence. In the sand trap, the velocity must be very small. A rule of thumb for the velocity of water in the sand trap is about, uh, we will check on the web page if I'm giving the same number, but it's about 0 0.10, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 meters per second. It's already 0.2, it's already a bit, it's a significant velocity. In the, in the gravel trap, we can tolerate higher velocity. For the gravel trap, we need, as I said, and also for the sand trap, we need to clean them. How to clean them? Usually they are cleaned through flushing. Flushing means that we have a bottom discharge that is protected by a gate, which is normally closed. In order to flush the gravel trap, we allow the gravel trap to get full of water, and then we open the gate of the bottom discharge, so a flow, a turbulent flow is originated, which brings the gravel out from the bottom discharge. Usually it's not an automatic procedure, meaning that uh, Flushing is not sufficient to remove the gravel, so you need somebody going there and uh, just helping the gravel to, to go out. This is also useful because, uh, you know, if you bring back the sediments to the river, it, it helps uh, to minimize the environmental impact of the structure. You have to be careful when building these structures because if sediments are, uh, are uh, blocked or moved away, Downstream, you originate erosion because uh, erosion in rivers is caused by the energy of the of uh, the flow. It's compensated by deposition of sediments. So, if you have a flow with high energy but a corresponding high bed load, erosion is minimized because the energy of the current of the flow tends to erode the river bed. But there is deposition, so there is a continuous exchange of sediments, because the riverbed is continuously a dynamic environment, a continuous exchange of sediments between the riverbed and the current. If you remove sediments from the current, then erosion is automatically increased, because this continuous exchange is compromised. And this is clear, it happens in many situations. And therefore, if you bring back the sediments, it's a good idea, and usually, Keep in mind that uh, you are not allowed to release uh, a large amount of sediments suddenly. You need to make it uh, with uh, gradual operations, which means that uh, in this case you are dealing with uh, small, small traps, uh, so it's, it's not a big problem. But if by chance you work with a trap that is very large and you accumulate a large amount of sediments, uh, you need to clean it quite frequently, or when you decide to clean it, to make a gradual release of sediments, because otherwise uh, there is a, an, an impact on uh, the 
fluvial ecosystem that is uh, very, 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 very heavy because you, you are not just releasing uh, gravel, you are also releasing mud. And, and therefore, you know, you understand that for fishes, for, for the turbidity of water downstream, it, it's a big impact. Okay, so there is also to say that here, besides uh, the flushing spillway, you need to set up a facility that allows to bring back to the river potential overflows. In this case, we have only one. There is the stop spillway that is highlighted in, in gray here. We don't have a top spillway for the gravel tap because here we suppose that if you have an excess flow, then you have this excess flow transferred to the sun trap and then evacuated <coughs> through the top spillway. But you have always to avoid flows, uncontrolled flows of water. You have to predict whatever can happen in this infrastructure. So you have to predict that a flood flow may come, a flood flow that may surmount this wall and get into the gravel trap. And this flood flow, you have to predict what is the way that, that follows to flow downstream. You have to predict everything because uncontrolled flows are extremely dangerous because uh, if they occur over soils, they, have, uh, they can rapidly erode the soil and they can undermine the stability of the structure and the stability of the hill slope. So it happened already that after building a barrage, the river found another way laterally on the sides of the barrage because, of course, when you have a flood flow, the flood flow must go downstream. And therefore, if you, if you didn't design the barrage well, the flood flow finds another way. And it happened that by finding another way, the flood flow eroded the islope and the islope collapsed. So this is extremely dangerous. And uh, you need to make a prediction of whatever can happen. And in this case, if you, by chance, have for some reason an overflow inside here, you have to design a top speedway that allows you to bring back to the river in a safe way the success flow. Okay, now there is the sun trap. The sun trap... Mm, yeah? Uh, how did the, the step between the gravel trap and sun trap work? Uh, how is the step? The step the, that divides the gravel trap and sun trap. Okay, I, that, like, I, I think it is useful if I try to make a cross-sectional section. And uh, so uh, a view by, by this side. So if you have the, the gravel trap here, this is the gravel. And then you have the sun trap downstream. And uh, let's suppose that this, have, uh, uh, this is the free surface. Let's suppose that this is about 50 centimeters. And the step is something like this. It is submerged. And therefore, if you, the, the gravel usually goes uh, in the lower level of the flow, and therefore you get gravel settled down here. Did I reply to your question? Yeah, yeah. OK, perfect. So how are these uh, gravel trap and sun trap designed? First of all, if we look at the sun trap, uh, the sun trap is usually divided in two channels, two channels to allow selective cleaning, alternate, alternate cleaning. Okay? And not always, but for important structures, we usually make two separate ways. And then you have this uh, um, flushing sluice way that is extended to the second channel here. This is why you see dashed lines here. Now, the way they are designed, of course, we have to, what do we have to design? We have to design the depth of the gravel and sun trap, and I gave you an order of magnitude, 50, 70 centimeters. We have to design the width and the length. It's clear that it's, it's um, intuitive that if you make it uh, wider, then you have the opportunity to reduce the length. Why? Because if you make it wider, you increase W, you can decrease the, the depth, and therefore the sediment takes less time to reach the floor of the sand trap. 
and therefore you don't need a so long trap. Conversely, if you reduce W because you don't have space, then necessarily you have to increase the depth. And if you increase the depth, the segment takes more time to reach the floor, and therefore you need to make a center up longer. And how are these elements, depth, width, and length design? I'm now focusing on the sun trap. Because for the sun trap, we have a quite well codified, in technical terms, procedure for the design. For the gravel trap, usually we go with a more empirical approach. And once we design the width, the length of the sun trap, we usually make the length of the gravel trap about half. Okay? Because, you know, it's clear that if you make a mistake in the design of the gravel trap, what happens is that some gravel may get into the sun trap. It's not so bad. The important thing is that at the end of this facility, we don't have in downstream any more sediment that is not tolerated, not possible to tolerate. And therefore, it is justified that we put attention here. And Upstream, you know, if we make some mistakes, uh, we can anyway have a compensation during the sun trap. Let's now focus, as I said, on the sun trap. First, we have a first constraint, which is the velocity here. And the velocity, let me check, because I don't want to say something different with respect to what you find. The velocity. Okay, no, let me just check because I don't find it. I think it is 0.15, just one second. Yeah, okay. The velocity is in the range 0.05, 0.15, to make sure that turbulence is avoided. Good. Let's go up. So this is a first constraint, which uh, has to be placed here. This is in the range 0 0.05, 0 0.15. QD is assigned. Therefore, you have the area, which can be computed here. Now, the area is given by the product. Let me see if I use the same symbols for the depth and width. Just one second. No, OK. LD was the symbol for the length. So. The symbol that I'm using on the web page is H here. Okay, is H. For the width, I think it is W. Let's give W. So A, A is equal to H times W. At this stage, we have an additional constraint on H, we said that it's uh, between 50 70 centimeters. So here it's 50 70 centimeters. The width may be unconstrained if you have space on the side, may be constrained by the shape of the slope. So you have to check if it's uh, Unconstrained, it's much better to enlarge the width. What is a reasonable width for a sand trap or a sand or a gravel trap? Let's say 5-10 meters. Okay, it depends on the importance of the structure. It depends on the flow that you are withdrawing. 
but usually for mountain uh, rivers, uh, I don't see usually sand traps that are larger than 5, 10 meters, uh, and they can be also less than 5. And then you see whether by, give, by having given the value of A, you have a value of H, you get a value of H that is constrained into the range. Of course, you have some flexibility. You can play with the, these numbers a little bit. At the end of this reasoning, you end up with the design values for the width and the depth of the sun trap. And now we have to design the length. Okay, let's make a section here, or uh, no, let's use this. I think this is useful. How do we design the sun trap? We design the sun trap by assuming that you have a particle of sand that is entering into the sun trap with, uh, by staying at the free surface. This is the worst situation, because if you have a particle that is entering below the surface, the trip to reach the floor is uh, shorter. If the particle is located on the surface, of course, uh, you are in the worst situation. And now what happens to this particle? This particle is subjected to gravity, which brings it along the vertical direction. So this is gravity, g. And then there is the velocity of the flow, the velocity of the flow, v which brings the particle along the horizontal direction downstream. We know V. We know V because uh, after this calculation, we know that V is uh, in the range 0.05 or 0.15. Having gone through this calculation, we know V. Hmm? The trajectory of the particle will be